<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Creekside Bible Study. Uh, let's just get started with actually Dave Prison. Sure. Uh, Father God, we just uh, thank you for this opportunity to come and um, to study your word, Lord. Thank you for Wayne Davis at Creekside Messiaen for the insights that he that he was able to get from his teachings, Lord. Father God, we just ask you to open up our hearts so that we can and give and have the Holy Spirit lead us so we can understand your scripture. And Father God, with Troy, just push him out of the way, Father God, and just you speak through Troy to God. We love you and adore you, and we look forward to seeing what you're going to do here tonight, Lord. Amen. Amen. And the dog says amen. So we are in Romans 7. And what Romans 7 is, is a continuation of Romans 6, Paul supposedly explaining better the concept of Romans 6. Let me minimize real quick. Um, the wording isn't, it's supposed to be easier. You're supposed to be making it more layman's term, if you will. But if you read it, it's still kind of confusing. So we're going to break it, go through it. So what was the concept of Romans 6 that he's going to try to explain again? Mostly in that, I read it, verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace may genointa. He's going to kind of break down, down that concept a little bit, supposedly. Yep. That we're saved by grace Does he need a pen? and faith and not by the law, but the law still in effect. Still, still applies. Yeah. And we're going to try, I'm going to try to get us through, so we've got to kind of take this, this whole thing in one chunk. I'm hoping we'll get through verse 14. Um, try not to make too many side notes because you kind of need to take it all, <laughs> take it all in one chunk. So let's just jump in and get started. So verse seven, Romans seven, verse one, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has a dominion, so with the dominion again? Don't everyone volunteer at once. Rule, rule the reign. That the law has rule or reign, dominion over a man as long as he lives. So before we break into this, let's look at brethren. Well, who is Paul talking about when he says brethren here? Believers. Let's head back to Romans 1, 13. Then Romans, just scroll up more. Pick the pages back to Romans 1, 13. You were there like two years ago? Just about, I think it was three years. Mm -hmm. We're going to tackle this brethren real quick, just to get the idea of Romans, of Paul speaking, who he's speaking to. Romans 1, 13, Dave, when you are ready. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you just as among the other Gentiles. So he's speaking to Gentiles and other mm -hmm. Gentiles. But he's also, he's, he's in verse 14. Let's continue on. Go read 14. 114? Yes. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to, both to wise and to unwise. So he is a debtor. And if we, I think it's in Acts. It talks about he's a debtor to the Greeks, the Jews, Scythians. He's to everybody. Paul isn't just speaking to Gentiles. He's not, not just speaking to Jews. He's speaking to everybody. everybody why exactly. is he a debtor? Good question. Why is he a debtor? <laughs> anybody? Because what, he, of what Christ has done in his life, it's that he owes it to others to share it with them. What was he doing that put him in debt, you could say? Persecuting them, killing them, locking them up. Yep. He's persecuting persecute yep. the church. So he's in debt because of he feels some kind of conviction that now he needs to, you know, preach the gospel to them. Yep. He took God took someone who was persecuting the church, mm -hmm. killing people, throwing them in jail, completely flipped it. And now he was the biggest proponent for Christianity. I would say his conviction was a little more than just feeling some sort of conviction. It was blinded. You know, when you're blinded Damascus, and God comes right blinded. out to you and speaks to you. That's about as convicted as you can get. <laughs> Let's head to 1 Corinthians 11, 1 and 2. I'm sorry. So the word um, brethren, he's speaking to Gentiles, to pretty much. Speaking to everybody. Brethren, as we as we use it, anyone who is basically in the faith. Brothers in Christ, people Whether who they're Jewish, saved. Gentile, wherever country you're from, that's that's the family of God. It's not defined by by national borders by languages it's 
if you believe in Christ, the actual biblical Christ, then you are a brother or a sister in Christ. That is the family. Oh, yeah. First uh, Corinthians 11, 1 and 2. And you got to make a distinction about a, a biblical Jesus. That's the distinction we all need to make because there are plenty of different Jesuses out there. Not all of them are the actual legitimate one. Um, First Corinthians 1 and 2. Hugh, when you are ready. Um, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So that's what we're supposed to be doing as we walk with Christ. Keep on going. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the tr traditions just as I delivered them to you. So he's talking to the brethren again here, believers, and he's telling them to keep the what? Traditions. You know, the traditions are more like the commandments. Those are things that Paul has been doing that are supposedly from Judaism, the commandments, the laws, the feasts, the festivals. Those are things he's telling the Gentiles to do. So again, Paul, everyone says, Paul says, oh, you know, the laws abolished. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do all the Jewish stuff anymore. Well, now he's telling the, the Gentiles here, the brethren, to keep the traditions. Hmm. Never done away with. Um, we got, I think we got one or two more. Um, Numbers 15, Old Testament. Numbers 15. Yeah, Numbers 15, 15, and 16. Because it's always been this way. It's, there was never a change in the New Testament where Christ said, oh, no, now, now the Gentiles are coming in. Now the Gentiles, no, it's, it's always been that way. Uh, Alex, when you're ready, 15 and 16. All right. One ordinance shall be for you of the assembly and for the stranger who dwells with you, an ordinance forever throughout your generations. As you are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. One more. 16. One law, one custom shall be for you and for the stranger who dwells with you. Now, who's the stranger? For you? Exactly. As Dave has mentioned before, back in Egypt, <laughs> the plagues are happening and, you know, fires raining down. It's darkness, frogs, all this stuff's happening. And some of those Egyptians are like, man, it's kind of nice over there in Goshen where those Jews are. But they ain't got all this crap going on. I want to go hang with the Jews. And that's what yeah, the strangers are. I like their God. I like what their God's doing. Exactly. And a, a stranger is actually um, a non-Jew who has tied himself, committed himself to the to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Esther. And they're like, yes, but and it was like grafted no, Esther was actually in. Jewish. That's it, exactly, and it's grafted I'm in. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. Naomi. Ruth. 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 Yeah, yeah. That's what you're thinking about. Yep. Ruth. Okay. Okay. Um, so yes, it's always been this way. And there's there's a I guess a doctrine, a teaching, and sometimes in messianic circle circles about one law of theology versus two law of theology. Actually, one of the churches I was at where I was at before, they believed in two law of the theology. And the idea was there was one law for the Gentiles and one law for the Jewish. Well, here it's pretty pretty clear that there's one law for everybody. Yeah. There is no distinction between and, Jews and Gentiles. And just and if you want to try to break it, separate it even more, you have a problem with Ezekiel 43. Because Ezekiel 43, where, and we're not going to go there, we're trying to get someplace else. But um, Christ rules, walk through the Eastern Gate. He's reigning from a throne, and he will be in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And if you're not part of the children of Israel, you're not with Christ forever. And that's where, and you'll go back into, if you read through down into, I think it's Ezekiel 44, when they're giving you the inheritance of the land and the stranger will be as a native born in the tribe in which he lives. That's us. Although a lot, some of us could be Jews because nobody, God knows, but we don't know where the northern kingdom, Ephraim and, you know, Israel, where they got scattered to. I've heard the, the the thought that perhaps part of the diaspora was spreading Jewish lineage literally throughout the world. And that after a certain amount of time, everybody would have some Jewish blood in them. It's very possible. And there's a passage that we covered in Zechariah where he's talking about that. And he says, I planted you in all these different countries. Yes. God had a, a reason behind the diaspora, just behind uh, punishing the Jews. There's a further purpose. Let's head back to Romans 7. So this lays down the foundation that Paul was speaking to everyone, and the brethren are the brothers and sisters in Christ. 
So I'm going to take us all the way through to, I think, verse four. I'll start from one again. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman, now you get, he's, what he's going to do here, he's taking the, the, the picture of marriage and using that as a picture of, he's trying to use that as an analogy for what he's talking about. So you could use, what's, so in, in marriage, what is, what is the husband? Who is the husband? Yes, and in the spiritual realm, who is who is the husband? Make sure Jesus. Jesus. Who is the wife? Church. Exactly. So you could you could somewhat insert that in here, where the wife is the church, the the husband is Christ. For the woman who has had a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband dies, she is released from that law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. And another way of calling adultery is idolatry. That's why you can kind of use this synonymously. She will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no, she, she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Let me take the verse four. Therefore, my brethren, you have also become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should be, we, that we should bear fruit to God. So breaking this down, you can think of the previous husband as being your sinful state. That's the best way. That's the best picture I can kind of paint for, for you guys. It's your previous husband is your fleshly desires, if you will. Exactly. And that that husband should die. Just like he said, that if the husband dies, you're no longer bound to that sinful state. Now you can get a new husband, that new husband being Christ. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's essentially what he's saying here. But you're released from that when your husband dies. That's what I'm saying. Because if your simple so state how, dies, how long? Um, how long before Christ dies? Never. Never. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So that's what once, eternity is. Once you are committed to Christ, it's for eternity. You're not released because your husband's not going to die. You should be married to Christ forever. There's no going back. There shouldn't be going any back anyways. So let's pick up at verse five. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to God. When he says in the flesh, he's talking about before we were saved, before we were saved. Let's head to John 15, 19. Real quick. This is a phrase when we were in the flesh. Remember it. Because he will use it over and over as we're going through Romans and elsewhere in his in his things that whenever you see in the flesh, it's before you were saved and you were being ruled by your fleshly desires, exactly. which are not good. You do not want to be in your flesh, which leads me to one of my side points. Mm -hmm. The saying, what is it? Um, we are not, oh, you should be, not of the world, but in the world, yeah. which you guys have probably heard. Yeah. Of. We're yes. in the world, but not of the world. Yes, did I say it the opposite way? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so John 15, 19. Because yes, we are in the world, obviously. We're living here, we're breathing we here. To the world, but we shouldn't belong in it, but, but not of it. That's the shortened version of and it. And Christ basically said you can't love the world and love him. You can't do it. Love of the Father is not it. Exactly. I think that's one of, one of the verses we're going to cover. I'm going to run through these real quick. Dave, you ready? I'm not there yet. Right. John what? John 15, 19. I'll read these. So we Go can ahead. Kind of... I was in the movie, period. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So John 17, 14 through 16. John 17, 14. Yeah, 14 through 16. You guys already? Mm -hmm. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Again, us, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, that you should keep them, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So we are to stay in the world um, with some protection from the Holy Spirit so we can still engage with the world. That they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The next one is Romans, 
actually what's the first John 2 15 real quick sanctify them uh sanctify them by your word your word is truth so how he's sanctifying us is that we have the scriptures it's not what somebody tells us it's not that the holy spirit <laughs> told us something we have his word amen this is the truth we need to study to show ourselves approved. We need to devour this because it's real easy for somebody to say, oh, the Bible says this. And I'm like, and I get it all the time on Facebook. I'm like, okay, what verse? Scripture, yeah. Show Captain it to verse. me. The scripture trumps opinion every day. I, I mentioned before I had my, my, um, a childhood like youth ministers say i said something about the word they said well you know the holy spirit can talk to us too right here sanctify them by the truth your word is truth that's how we're sanctified don't miss it um what's my next one? first john 2 15 2 15 this is my favorite verse the first verse that I really grabbed as a Christian when I was um when I was a baby Christian. First John you know, 215. 215. You can take it through seven. Well, we'll take it all the way through 17 just for just do it. Um, but just personally, I I love this verse. Um, it's very simple. It's a command. It gave me a path to start. Do not love the world or the, the things of the world. Again, that's a very simple command. Very men, we like clear instructions, and this is a very clear instruction. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. You can see that right now before our eyes. And the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And again, everyone will abide forever. It's just a matter of location. Location, location, location. Exactly. If you, want, you? If you want that lake of fire, it's, it's available for you. Lake front. <laughs> yeah. Lakefront oh, property. Yeah. You can get some really good lakefront property, but you can't leave the lake. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that verse was in the movie Fury. Was it? Yeah. I don't remember that. Sorry. All right. Uh, Romans 12 2. Little preview of where we'll be in another decade or so. Romans, Romans 12 2. Romans 12 2. Oh. Oh, yeah, a classic. Mm -hmm. And do not be conformed. What does it mean to be conformed? Be part of? I think. No, to be to be molded by, yeah. kind of, or to be... Like you can conform or form. You can think of just as forming. So that. let the world change and affect who you are to yeah. make you be who you are. Exactly. Identify with the world. No, it's not identifying no, with the world. It's more. It's the world changing you. Right. You can think of forming, like when you form something. That's right. what it's. You're, the world is conforming yeah, you to it's. So identity. You're not just identifying with it. It's changing you, because of what comes through your eyes, okay. your ears, your, your thoughts, everything. Well, I may be accepted. But you're ex you're ex accepting that like it. You said okay. This is, I will do this because it's easier. I will accept that. All right, there's a computer term, garbage in, garbage out. If you keep getting fed garbage, it'll affect who you are and change who you are. That's what he's talking about. It's about the world changing you. It's actually, let's keep on going on. Conform to this world, and but be transformed. So there's conforming and there's transforming. And transforming, you could think of them sort of similar, but transforming is basically becoming new. When you're transforming something, it's becoming something different, something new. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good. What is that? Wait, prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. So you're being transformed and your mind's being renewed. Amen. So you're becoming to that perfect will of God. Again, the process of sanctification. Exactly what this is talking about. So it could be like you were a car and then you become a mighty warrior transformers you could think of it that way yeah. Mean, yeah. yeah you could think of it but that's what a transformer is you, you yeah. change into something else that's what, yeah that's what a transformers were you give your car and now you're a, a robot first you can change something bad you can yes you can transform into something bad but you don't want that unless you want to lick a fire 
Um, let's head back to Romans. Romans Still 7. There. Where are you, Romans? Romans 7, verse 6. Actually, let's, uh, let me go through verse 5 again. Um, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. How are our sinful passions aroused by the law? Any takers? Rebellion. Rebellion. I call it the, the forbidden fruit syndrome. The idea of, Dave, I tell you not to do something. What's the first thing you want to do? Do it. Exactly. That's what the first thing. Because I call her outside the lines. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thank you for confessing that. <laughs> but that's what that's what Genesis was. I say God said, marriage. God said, <laughs> don't eat the fruit. What they do? They eat the fruit. You tell a kid not to do something. What they do? They they sit there and do whatever you told them not to do. It's annoying. I'm a parent. That's what happens. But that's part of. Sinful state. Kind of sinful nature. Yes, it's a. I think it was. A, well, no, it was you mean definitely the sinful nature that was crucified when became it when became transformed into a new creation. Well, we we like <laughs> <laughs> sin. We still have that sinful nature until we part ways. From yes, it. like yeah. the transformation it starts there, but yes, it there, doesn't end until until you die. Essentially, yeah. it should be getting that sinful state. That sinful so being loves, should be should be less and less and less. Yeah. Okay. If, if nobody ever told you you're not supposed to do something, it's wrong, then it's not wrong. That's what the law did. The law told us what is sin. What is it that you're supposed to do? What is it you're not supposed to do? And when you see that, it, it arouses those things in us. Yeah. No, but it, touching on that, it's a little bit different with Adam and Eve because they didn't have a sinful state. Right. They had a serpent lurking around in the in the garden. He was saying, "Hey, you shouldn't." Uh, did God, did God really say? So a little bit different, sure, but, but, but same concept. They screwed up and they screwed up for everybody, for everybody else. Dang. Yeah, Adam's going to have a lot of uh, <clears throat> punches in the face when he gets to heaven if there's any violence allowed. But see, they had a counselor with them every day that was guiding them. And they still screwed up. <laughs> Me over here. I think Walter, you saying something? Oh, oh yes. Explaining. <laughs> That's some Adam's blaming. So, okay, let's do verse six. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. This is another thing you have to keep in mind. This is uh, the whole letter of the law and, and the spirit of the, the oldness of the law and the, the newness of the spirit. It's another thing that Paul's going to use over and over and over again. And let's scroll back up, up to, well, I'll scroll back up, go to six, verse six, chapter six, verse 15. Let's read this because this is kind of what you got to keep this in mind about what he didn't say with 615. Because you could easily take what he just said and say, oh, the law is bad. That one's bad. <laughs> so that's, let's go back up to 615. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace, certainly not. And this is the reason we spent so much time on, on, that, on that concept, because that he's not saying the law is abolished. And remember, under law, remember the word under was more by, so saved by law, but saved by grace. That, so what does he mean exactly when he says, but now we have been delivered from the law? Real quick, let me read another verse. Romans 3, 20, or 31. Do we make void the law through faith? I know I pronounced it wrong. Yeah. On the contrary, we establish the law by faith. Mm. Establish, <laughs> the word establish here, it's a building term. We establish the law by faith. So when he says, going back to seven, seven verse six. Um, so now having been delivered from the law, you can think of when you when you think of that, it's subjugation to the law. Before we were saved, we were subject to the law, you, to, to the law and subject to your sin. You had to sin. You essentially, that's what your, your flesh wanted to do. You didn't have the Holy Spirit. You didn't have Christ. You didn't have God. You didn't know what the Bible was. All you knew to do was sin. Your body said, let's do it. And you're like, I'm on board. 
Let's do it. Right. So you're delivered from that subjugation. That's I'll, what it is. Okay. No, don't do that. Don't, li <laughs> don't listen to you. He's going to the lake of fire. <laughs> where? Where? The where it talks about the oldness of the letter. Where was that? The law. Think of Moses. What changed between the newness of the spirit and the oldness of the the old oldness of the letter? What changed? Where was the law before? Written on stone tablets. Mm -hmm written down the holy spirit comes into us into the heart the holy spirit should be moving us to to study to follow the law why what's the difference because beforehand it was if you don't do this you die but now why is it that we should want to follow the law if you love me, you, love me, you will follow my commandments. Mm -hmm. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit working in us that we can do that. And that's how we show our faith. And it'll even be really cool when the when the new covenant's actually in effect. And I think we just sort of like get plugged in and get a download, like up matrix. upgrade the uh, software. Yep. Or something, and it will be in our mind and in our hearts. But it's not so much you have to do this or you die. You want to do it. I want to do it because I'm filled with the Spirit, and that's what the Spirit should be moving us to do. That's what changed. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. So that's the oldness and the newness concept. Let's go to Second Corinthians 3. So again, remember that concept of the newness of the spirit and not the oldness of the letter. You will see that you, again. You will see that again. Paul, Paul lays down certain arguments or certain phrases. And once you understand those phrases, if you take those to the rest of the writings, he makes so much more sense. Because remember, Paul is the one who says, uh, Peter said Paul is hard to understand. So if you can get some of those smaller concepts he, lay, he lays down, it's easier to understand what he is actually saying. Um, so 2 Corinthians 3, um, 1 through, I believe, 1 through 3. Everyone there? Yes. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendations from you? What's an epistle? Letter. letter. It's a letter. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is of the heart. So that's what he's saying. These people he's ministering to, they're not, they're not tablets. You guys aren't tablets. I'm not a tablet. We are, you could consider us the newness of the spirit because we have the Holy Spirit and we're going out, we're ministering to people. So that's how the spirit works. It's not, we're carrying around tablets and we throw these tablets, people and say, you got to obey all this right now. We're going to help. No, it's, it's the spirit. We're led by the spirit. Let's head back to Romans 7. The fact that we're led by the Spirit, the Spirit can't say something that's contrary to the to the Word, shouldn't or yes. to the law. What were the four parts of truth? Go ahead. What, what, what are they? Four is one. The law is another. One. Well, the Torah is a law. That's one. <laughs> the script, the full script. Every word of God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus is another truth. Yep. And another, another. We just the been about, yeah, the spirit, spirit, yeah. So they're all equal. They can't contradict each other. Interesting, you're so how you throw your voice. I hear your voice coming from over here. At <laughs> 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 uh, verse seven. Um, so and that's verse seven. Wait, yes, verse seven, seven, seven. I want to get my. And actually, I want to take it through. I'm going to read the whole the whole paragraph, and then we'll kind of break it down because this is another Paul doing a um, Paul doing. Are we a back in Romans? Yes, Romans back in Romans seven. seven. My bad. Seven seven. I'll take us seven all the way through twelve, just so we get the whole thing in context. Seven and then, seven. And then kind of break it down. Yes, seven seven, not three seven. So you're not winning the lottery, David. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Major nointo. 
On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. That's what Dave was just talking about. Mm -hmm. For I would not have known covetousness unless, unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Again, that's the concept Dave just talked about. You don't know the law. You don't know something's wrong until someone tells you it's wrong. Because he's, he's, So he's using the, the, the example here of covetousness, which is something we all have done. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and, and by, by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Does it sound like Paul is making an oxymoron? It sounds like, like he's fire hoses and there's so much in there, there's no way we can understand it. Yeah, it's, does it sound like he's talking out of both sides of his mouth? <laughs> Am I right? He's saying, wait, the law is dead, but the, the law is holy. It's, it's kind of all over the place, isn't it? Um, so we're going to kind of break this down a little bit. Uh, let's head to first. Well, let's first John three four. What is sin? Lawlessness. lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So that's what. What is lawlessness? Breaking God. No. Well, oh, yeah. yes, but <laughs> but yeah, but what is lawlessness? What is the biblical definition of lawlessness? Being without not, not, not in good standing with Christ. Mm -hmm. No. Not following God's commands. Close. Being the condition of being without law, either by choice or ignorance. And its opposite is righteousness. You cannot be righteous and lawless at the same time. Um, so, yeah, you can take lawlessness and just break down the actual word lawlessness. You take that, the second half of it lawlessness means wicked, you're without law. Um, it's like foolishness. Well, anyhow, um, is that the condition of being without fools? <laughs> that's why I, that's why I that was going to say that, but <laughs> um, I just want to mention that the law is a boundary. That's what that's what it is. That's what boundaries are. Instruction. instruction, but they're, they're boundaries to keep yeah. us from doing stupid stuff because there's they plenty us. of things we could do. What do you say? They protect us. They protect us exactly. And boundaries are good. And you think of um, I think probably the, maybe the two most powerful. I guess elements, things in our world are fire and water. You take them out of, their, out of their proper boundaries and they are very, very destructive. And those are also two things that God did what with. Judgment. One one he's already done, one he's going Judgment. to do. Judgment. He judged the world with uh, and Noah water. with water. He's going to do it again with fire. And also symbols of the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Yep. So fire and water are very powerful symbols. But if you have a fireplace and you have a fire in there, it's nice, right? Friendly. It's friendly. It's friendly. Warm. It's comforting. What happens if it jumps out of the fire? Well, very destructive. You, you scream, you yell, you drive a fire extinguisher. Yeah. <laughs> you follow the insurance claim. Start shopping for a new house. <laughs> yes. Water. If you have a pool, you swim in, it's nice, it's comforting, it's cool. If it's out of the water, so you have, I mean, out of the pool, so you have a tsunami or something. Not cool, right? I'm not an insurance claim. Well, it's also potentially death. But yes. Um, if those things jump out of their boundary, they are not good. So that's what the law is. I just wanted to lay that concept out. Also, the law, it keeps us in position of blessings. Yes. Correct? Yes. Right. It is a blessing to be saved. So um, let's see, verse 8, Romans 7. We're, just going to, we're going to break this, this whole thing down. But sin taking an opportunity by the commandment produced in me all kinds of evil desire. From for from apart from the law, sin was dead. And that's kind of the same idea of that forbidden fruit syndrome. And in verse nine. Well, if if there's no law, there is no sin. That's why it's dead. Yes. You can't you have to be aware of it for it to because have effect. It's only sin. If you're breaking the law, if there is no law, there's nothing to break. If, you're if there's down no the... speed limit, that's what I'm gonna say. you no can drive limit. as fast as you want. I mean, the consequences may be death, but you're not breaking the law. They can't punish you for it because there's no speed limit listed. But, you know, and a lot of people talk about that the law is abolished. 
but yeah. we're not supposed to sin. Well, then what sin if there is no law? Yeah. And then you get into people's personal opinions about good and evil. Okay, and they'll say, well, it's the law of Jesus, but Jesus never broke down all the good and evil. He never gave you those boundaries. It Without the law, there is no good or evil because, you know, what you think is good and evil is going to be completely different than what George Soros thinks good and evil is, which will be completely different than what Hitler thought good and evil was. Yeah. It can't be defined by man. It has to be defined by God. And that's what Torah is. And that's, I'm glad you brought that up because that's what the, what's the law of the church of Satan? Do as thy wilt shall be or the whole, the whole of the law. So basically you can do whatever you want. Right. But how do you determine what's acceptable? Like I can stab Dave and it could be acceptable. I could do this. I could do that. There's, there's various things you could like, there's no establishing foundation to figure out what's acceptable what's unacceptable so that's what that's what the the, the church of satan their law is it's lawlessness literally so the, there's no their structure law, their law is lawlessness yes pretty much well, do their, what you want their law is to get you to break god's law and that's what the world wants you to do. they want you to break god's laws that's why all this stuff that's against god's laws <laughs> are being pushed down everywhere hmm. exalts itself against the knowledge of god Exactly. So verse, it's uh, verse nine. I was once, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So I was once alive once without the law. Now, how are we, how are we alive once without the law? How can you be alive without the law? Essentially kind of binding. You know, lawlessness. No, well, there's. You're not in a relationship with God. Partly. So what I'm trying to get at is the idea of accountability, essentially. There's a certain point where you're not accountable. You have a you know, seven-month-old, they're not really accountable. They have no idea what's going on. And that's a part, there's a certain point where all of us, and this gets into the whole age of accountability, and we'll touch that a little bit, um, where there's a certain point where you become aware of the law, aware of your sinful state, you're aware of how the, the consequences of that. And then there is, again, the age of accountability. Um, actually, let's jump to Psalm 51.5. What is the age of accountability? That's what we're going to touch on. Anybody, any ideas? Any thoughts? It can vary. The age it, of accountability? It's ultimately probably 13, isn't it? 13. That's what I've kind of leaned on. 13, that's what the Jewish people believe. Find it in the Bible. There, there, there is no yeah. definitive. Yeah, there's right. no. But I think I think it's the bat, God The bat mitzvah. Right. And... The bat mitzvah in 13 was created in the Middle Ages. The bar mitzvah for the women, uh, 1900s. The only thing about 13, it's not there. It's not, it's not in the scripture. So, but it's at, at five, you were supposed to be studying the mitzvah. At 10, you were supposed to be studying something else. And by 13, you were supposed to be studying the commandments. But this is all commandments of men. There is nothing in scripture about it. Yeah, it's all sub it's all subjective. We're just this is thing people think think people think of. There are some scriptures that support the idea of age of accountability. We'll look at a couple of those. But first, let's go to. I can tell you where it is. Well, I know, I know, I know which one you're going. To. I think I have. I should have another one. I got to check my notes. Okay. Um, Psalm fifty-one five. Do you know where I'm going? Uh, it's yes. I don't know. I know what you're talking about. I, don't, I know the scripture. I don't know what the location. We're going to kind of tackle this subject a little bit. The bottom line. If you're not old enough to understand, you get a pass. Yes, essentially. You know what I mean? Uh, I but yeah, we're going to touch. So you're alive. You're, you're alive. You're the physical, yes, you're ignorant. Yes. But first, uh, so Psalm 51 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. I want to lay down the concept of even though you are maybe innocent and you, you know, a month old, two months old, six months old, and you're, you have no accountability. In sin, my mother conceived me. You're still a sinful person at birth, period. That's just that's right. inherited. That, sin. that imputed sin nature is with us, period. 
you're born in sin. I just want to lay that down. That's a, that's a truth there. Um, Dave, you have your, your verse? Yeah, give me a minute. Um, I want to lay down, I think it's... Well, age of accountability is when you're like 12, 13. That's, see, people, it, it depends. That's see, an opinion. It's a, it is you, a, you don't have any scripture to support that. We know that, Dave. We, there's no scriptures <laughs> to support it, but this there's something to think about. You kind of think about, and with every child, it's different. Some you can you can usually tell with your own child because you know your child when they can start understanding what sin is, the nature of it, the punishment behind it. And this is why I'm I'm not very big on big on when children get saved at like five, six, seven years old. They really don't grasp the full idea of what's going on. And well, hold on a second. And what ends up can ha end up happening is they think they're saved because they made some. I've seen kids at four made a profession of faith. Four year old does not really grasp the under the weight of sin. Yeah. And then they're told when they're growing up and they're teenagers, oh, you're saved, you, you did this, you did this, you did the baptism, you raised your hand, you're saved, you're saved. And then they're going through their life thinking they're saved. No, you're not saved. You didn't understand well, what was well, going on. Although I know someone that was saved before. I'm just, yeah, it's, right. it's, I do. But it's, pos it's possible. I'm not going to say it's, it's impossible. Unusual. Yeah, I would say it's unusual. Um, but that's why I don't like children, really young children, doing the profession of faith. It's just, it makes me cringe. What were you going to say? I was going to say about the Amish um not their they got their truth cornered but they uh if if a child starts combing their hair and becomes kind of vain that's when they start punishing they they that's their designation of punish punishment that's pretty random but that's but they, they it's just like 13 yeah this, that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's their signal yeah it's their signal yeah but again you can tell with kind of every, every child um did I say Deuteronomy 139? Sorry. Deuteronomy 139. I'm still looking. 139. Yeah. I think yours is in um as you said it before. I know what you're I know where you're thinking, but I can't think of the actual verse. Yeah. you th uh, Exodus, right? That's what I thought. Exodus, uh, do I have it? 139. Wait, what? Go ahead. Go ahead. You guys thought we were going. Deuteronomy 139. 139. Yes, 139. Oh. Yes. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Yes, 130. Well, no, not one oh. verse, cha oh. chapter one, verse 39. Yeah, <laughs> Everyone's sticking on 39. <laughs> like there is no 39. You didn't you guys didn't get that new Bible with it. <laughs> all right. You guys all there? All right. Moreover, your little ones and your children who you say will be victims today, have no knowledge of good and evil. They shall go in there to them. I will give it and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a point where here was they, they have no knowledge of good and evil. And this is, you get your, it just jumps right off to yours. Right. Um, so, so what Dave is, if he doesn't have it. I don't have it, but let me explain it. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, who got who went to go into the promised land when they can when God passed down the judgment because they grumbled and complained and said there's giants in the land? Who was allowed to go into the promised land for the from the people that were there at that point? Anyone who was over 20 or under 20? 20 and older were to die in the wilderness. Except Caleb and Joshua. It wasn't everybody. So but hold on. There were two of the spies. There were the two spies that said, yeah, it's good to go. Yeah. But 19 and under, that punishment did not apply to them. They were able to go into the promised land. Going into the promised land is a picture of going into the millennial kingdom. Um, but now when you look, and the other thing is with 20 years old, 20 years and older is when you're eligible to go to war. 19 and under, you don't go to war. But now if you translate that today, you got to subtract a year because the Jews understood that life began at conception. They, they, consent, they considered a newborn child to be a year old. Yeah. So instead of it being 19 and under, it's 18 and under. And that's a picture of going into the to the millennial kingdom. And when you start arguing, well, you know if your child and they know if their child there's no real standard there. You know, that's based on opinion. There's got to be something from scripture that gives you sort of a even playing field. 
Yeah, but everyone's you can you're not going to find that. It doesn't it doesn't exist. I, we, you have the idea. Working in children's ministries, I know parents who believe their children are ready to accept God, and I and I was teaching these children. I know they weren't. Yeah, I, that's there's the case, but there are some who are younger who can grasp it. It's it's going to be different for your individual child. Again, you you should know if it's your child. Anyhow, let's yeah. um. Second Samuel twenty, Second uh, Samuel twelve twenty one. Second Samuel twelve. Yes, we'll tackle this just one more verse to kind of bolster the idea, and then we'll jump back to Romans. Second Samuel twelve twenty one through twenty three. This is David in his sin with Bathsheba. 21. Yep, twelve twenty one through twenty three. David did some bad stuff, yeah. hanging out in his palace, overlooking, and he's Wasn't all me. naked lady. I didn't do it. <laughs> um, then his servants said to him, what is this you have done? Speaking to David, you fasted and fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. So let me get the context um, for those online. Everyone here knows, just for those online. David, he was hanging out on his rooftop. He saw a naked lady. He did some stuff. She got pregnant. He tried to get her husband to come back because her husband, Uriah, was in war. So David puts a scheme together. He's trying to get the husband to come back and sleep with his wife. So she thinks the child's his. He doesn't want to do it. He says, oh, I, I, I'm, my brothers are at war. I shouldn't be here. I should be out with my brothers on war. Um, so he doesn't sleep with his wife. So David's like, oh, crap. Well, let me just send him off to the, the, the fiercest part of some battle so he gets killed off. So he essentially commits murder because he's deliberately doing this. And then... Um, <clears throat> Uh, because of the adultery, and then the child dies as a as a result of all this. So this, that's where we're at right now. So then a servant said to him, what is this you have done, the adultery and the, the killing and the, the child dying? For you fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. David speaking again. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And that's that last part. I shall go to him, but he should not return to me. This isn't definitive, but a lot of people believe he's essentially saying that he knows his child is oh. going to heaven automatically because he's he, getting that age of accountability he's so young that if there's an automatic grant to heaven. So David's like, I screwed up. I know that my child's die, died, but he's so young, he's going to heaven. I'm going to heaven too because I have faith in Christ. So I'll see him again. That's the concept there. Just laying down that, that kind of... He was at peace. Yes, he was at peace. Because they were they were mad that he wasn't fasting, but he's like, well, why would I fast if he's, he's already gone? I can't bring him back. Right. God gave him his answer. Exactly. He got his answer. wasn't what he wanted, but he did get an answer. So back to Romans. Any questions? It's a stretch. It is. It's a little bit of a stretch. Okay. It, but I want to lay down the concept, the idea. Um, so back to Romans 7, what we have, verse 10. Yeah, it would be a cruel God if he would put a child who really is not cognizant enough to understand what scripture says and throw them in a lake of fire. Exactly. That's what most people say. And the only, only rebuttal approach to that, which makes some sense because God is omniscient, omnipotent. And omnipotent, and he can see the beginning from the end, is he could potentially see their potential life and their potential decisions. But I'm like, eh, you're kind of pushing it a little bit. Um, well, then we don't have to share the gospel with anybody. That, that's you, that. yeah, exactly. It gets into really weird territory when you start thinking that way. Where are we going? Uh, back to Romans 7, um, verse 10. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found bring death. Let me do 11 with it. For sin taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and it killed me uh, therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good um let's head to go head back to De let's deuteronomy look at that what you just read real quick which part start with 12 what does therefore mean because this is the crux of the whole argument What's it there for? Could... Yeah, whenever you see therefore, ask yourself, what's what is... it there for? Mm -hmm. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. So, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. 
for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and it killed me. All right, so the commandments, the law, is meant to bring life. The law. Yes. The law is meant to, this is, that's what it's saying. Head to Deuteronomy, keep on talking, but Deuteronomy 30. But we're the, gonna go. no, hold on, hold on a minute. But that's where we're going to go with that. You're, what you're talking about is exactly that. Yeah, verse. but we, hold on one minute. Because everybody does that and you're going to lose what's here. For sin, taking occasion by, by the commandment, deceived me. So the, the sin, the man of lawlessness is already at work in the world around us, is telling everybody today, you know, to follow the law. It's already done. You know, the, the man of lawlessness is already at work in the world around us. Lawlessness deceived me and by it killed me. So a lot of people are being killed by what was supposed to save them. Why? Because they're not following it. Therefore, understand the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. I had to. Sorry. Uh, Deuteronomy 30. I know you're trying to get somewhere. 15. Well, this I'm, we're trying to wrap up at verse 12. We don't have time to start at 13 because that's, that's a whole new yeah. whole new thing. Um, so we'll just tackle this real quick. Is that the one where you page of notes that he had lost or didn't have? Yes, which he, yeah, he, was, <laughs> he lost. I'm glad he did. Um, Deuteronomy 30, 15. Mm, verse, verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 15. Wait, well, you've got me all over the place. Sorry. You said 30. Yeah, 30, verse 15. <laughs> Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. You just, said you said you just said 13 a little while ago. Did I? Sorry, sorry. 315. Dude, you're worse than me. 30, 30, verse 15. 30, verse 15. 15, 3, 0. Yes. 13, 1, 1. Everyone there, 30, 15. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, and that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you, like you said, blessings, bless you in the land which you go to possess. So there's, there's life and good, and there's death and evil. And that basically depends on how you're walking. If you want to walk in righteousness, you get the life and the good. If you want to walk in lawlessness, you get the death. And you know, you said there's a lot of good butts in the Bible. Yes. This is not a good one. <laughs> yes, you're correct. That's not a good butt. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> um, one more. Ezekiel. No, but read, read sorry, 17. 17. I know how to finish it. Because we just talked about the life. Oh. You're, you're comparing two things here. Um, we started in verse 15. I have set before you today. Life right. and good, death and evil. Let's look at the bad as well as the good. That's what like most of the churches today, they just look at the, the good, good part. Stuff. Yeah, the Joel things. So you have a but. If your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. In other words, you're drawn away from the law. I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan. Oh, my goodness. That's cool. I'm sorry. Which you cross over the Jordan to go into and possess. I, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. You wouldn't want to have that. That I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, cursing. Therefore, choose life that be, both of you and your descendants may live. And I'll stop there. I just got to say one thing real quick. Oh, my goodness. And I never say one thing real quick. But, you know, it's life or death, whether you follow his ways or not. But when it talks about, how can I do this quickly? I can't. When you cross over the Jordan and go in and take possessions, that's a picture of eternity. That's a picture yep. of going into the promised land. Which, which I'm, I'm convinced happens on a year of Jubilee, where it says to cause the trumpet to sound. That word to sound is the same word you get here that says cross over. Mm -hmm. And if you look at everything about the year of Jubilee, the land goes back to the original owner. And in talking about a year of Jubilee, God says the land is 
mine. This is really cool. That's a wow for me. But yeah, he's talking about death eternally. That's what death ultimately is. There's two deaths. There's a physical death where you just die. Then there's a spiritual death. And that is where you are thrown in a lake of fire and eternity again. You live forever, but it's a matter of location. Um, I want to skip the verse I was going to. Let's head back to um, Romans. I want to get us through this. Sorry. Romans 7. <laughs> and we're almost done. We're pretty much at verse 12. I want to end it there anyways. Good. Back to Romans 7. 12. Start at 11 real quick and take us through 12. We kind of tackled 10. Dave kind of tackled that. For sin taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Dave kind of covered this a little bit, but it's interesting he says the word deceive because that's what sin does to us. It lies to us, it tricks us, it deceives us. Um, although some people think of, uh, there's transgression and there's this deception. Transgression and sin. Transgression is more of an overt, I tell you uh, not to punch somebody in the face. You deliberately punch them in the face. It's different than being tricked. Someone beguiles you into, into that. But sin is sin, essentially. Um, but deception, and the reason we have so much deception is false teachers. I mean, that's the reason after Christ gave his uh, Sermon on the Mount, one of the first things he talked about for uh, quite a while is false teaching. That's the deception of our day. And we've said it plenty of times here. We just talked about Joel Olstein, other churches, um, the church at large, I won't say at large, but a lot of the church is false teaching. They just, they've fallen into false teaching, the Roman Catholic church, the rabbinical system. That's a lot of that is false teaching. That's why there is so much deception. In Anybody the teaching lawlessness. That's why we, there's only a stairway to heaven, but a highway, highway to, to hell. Heaven. Yep. Most people are not making it. So that's deception. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So again, Paul did not, if you counter this with 615, where he said, oops, what then shall sin? So we sin because we are not under law, but under grace, Major Nointel. Again, he's not saying we're, he's saying the law is good here. He's not, he's not lying. So let's head to Acts 24, just to bolster the idea of Paul. 14. 24, 14. Verse that is probably a couple, couple, couple of these. Twenty four, fourteen. I think Gio. I think you were next. Excuse me. Yeah, Acts twenty four, fourteen. But this I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written, written in the law and in the prophets. So Paul is believing all things in the law and the prophets. There is no abolishing. Paul didn't say it was done away with. Uh, Romans 7. Well, was there another verse in Acts where he said something similar to you? I know he, there was. Did 20, you write it down? 25, 8. Yeah. That was trying to, you want to, you yeah, just, no, I just want to write it here as a reference. So if I go here, I can. Yeah, there it. is another verse. I'm trying to get us just through this. I know, I know. Go ahead. Acts 25, 8 for those taking their, taking notes. Kind of, bo again, bolsters the idea. Romans. We're going to Romans, back to Romans 7. Actually, no, I'll take it. That'll be the last one we'll do. Go to 1 Corinthians 9 first. All right. Ah. I know, I know. Kind of doing things out of order. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 8, and then we'll do Romans 7, 22, which we will, Lord willing, be there next week, but it'll be a little preview. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Everyone there? Yeah. Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle knocks, and we'll go on and on, on and on about that. Um, but he again, he's bolstering the idea. He says, does, or does not the law say the same also? So he's he's agreeing with the law. And then one more, but a Romans 7:22.
and this is very overt when he says this one, and he's actually, he may be quoting David from Psalms 1-2, but he's very, very clear in this. Walter, when you read it, when you're there, go ahead and read it. For the light in the law of God according to the inward man. Exactly. And that's just kind of the same thing I'll quote for you, Psalms 1-2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law, he meditates day and night. Like Dave said before, we ought to be meditating with day and night on scripture. We need to get that inside of us. And he's saying here, I delight in the law. So the law is good. It's holy. Paul didn't say it was done away with. It's something we should use. Again, it's boundaries. There's a reason it's there for our good. So it keeps us out of trouble, keeps us from doing stupid things. The law is good. It is holy. And with that, we'll wrap up here. I don't want to start the next... Um, the next we, paragraph. We're going to go to one other scripture real quick. We're going. And this is what Jesus had to say about it. Give me one second. Matthew, let me tell you that. So Matthew, you're thinking. Give me a minute. I think I know where you're going. Oops. Matthew 11. A scripture everybody, we all know, gets quoted all the time. I think it's starting in 29. Let me get there and see. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, come 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light yoke is a jewish idiom for the law for torah come to me all you labor and heavy laden i will give you rest take give me a second real quick when there's um, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What does Torah mean? Instruction. Instruction. Learn from him. Who wrote Torah? Jesus. God. Mm -hmm. Jesus. In the beginning, beginning God was one, one, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was God. So what he's saying here in this context is the law as it is written not what the Pharisees and the Jews have made it to be. Those are the commandments of men yeah. and the traditions of men, as you call them. Yes, yes. But doesn't the yoke is supposed to be something heavy and uncomfortable? No, it's not or... supposed to be heavy and uncomfortable. If it's done, if it's done like in agriculture, if it's done yeah. properly and you have, you're supposed to have two animals, equal strength, equal size, and if they're both pulling equally, it makes it lighter, and that's kind of the idea here. Right. If, you're, if you're with Christ, it gets easier. He's going to be... Exactly, yes. exactly. Yes. Now, if you have unequal or un different strength animals, one's going to be pulling more than the if, other. It's all off. If and you're on the side. obeying him and you're being blessed by him, you are yoking with Christ. Like you're in sync. And, exactly. and you're in sync with him. Mm -hmm. I heard that in those agricultural times, they used to put like an experience knots with a with a much younger and experienced ox. That way, you know, the one with most experience could you could train them and teach but the if, other but one. But if yeah. you put one with a with a uh, an animal that's not nearly as strong, mm -hmm. and you were unequally yoked, you're going to be unequally you're going to be as they pull, the they're going to go off. And they're going to veer off the path. Right. You know, we want our path to be straight. The Lord will make our way straight. Sure. We want to be yoked with Christ. That's that's what the yoke. That's what the phrase yoke means. And that's why he says my yoke is easy and my burden light. Because if you're doing it with Christ, again, I've said this before. <laughs> you look at the commandments and the law. It's really not that difficult. Huh. to adhere to um we tend to make it like oh there's this big law and there's certain things you can do and can't do we, we make them into these heavy laden things that aren't heavy essentially love god love people as jesus kind of simplified it that's really really mm -hmm. it 
Um, and if you're driven by if you're driven by your sinful nature, you're not going to want to do them. That's that's the crux of it. As the world does not want to do them because they're in their sin, sin, sinful state. So they're like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to obey this. They don't want to obey anything. They want to just do what their sin says. But if you have the spirit, bro, yeah, I'm having an issue with what you're saying. What? Because what what most of the people in the church today will say that 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 what Christ changed it to was just love God and love others. A new command I give you to love one another. But, and that's the law of Jesus. But there's no there's more than that. I know, I know. But that's the thing is with the love God and love others. And upon these, all of the prophets and the law and the prophets hang. It all goes together. Thing is, how many people <clears throat> stop eating pork here? Okay, number of hands went up. Was it as, as hard as you thought it would be? Yeah. No, it was actually easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really was easy. Oh. <laughs> I hear you. I know you shouldn't raise your hand either, regardless yeah, whether you like it or not. I got a wife that makes pork dishes. I hear you. I hear you. But seriously. But, and I stopped eating shrimp and shellfish. And I started doing the things in there. And I stopped working on the Sabbath. I mean, in my way. And my way is I don't do customary work. I don't do my job work. I won't even go down and, and like post the checks in my computer. You know, when I get money in the mail, I, I want to go down there and like <laughs> do that so I can start getting my deposits together. I won't do that on the Sabbath. It's easy. I won't take a phone call or call somebody about work on the Sabbath. That would drive me nuts. I'd be afraid I'd lose a job. You know? But the the driving factor it's behind been easy. That, the driving factor why it's easy is because you have the spirit. Because if you with again, if you're in that sinful state, you're not going to want to do that. Not the, the same thing. Like for me, when I got saved, one of the first things I had to do was stop cursing. And it wasn't really that difficult. I had to train myself to not do it continually. But um, same thing with some other stuff I was doing. But when you have the spirit with you, he's advocating for you. He's reminding you. That's what happened with me. I ran into the scripture. In several different places at several different times. And I was like, okay, God's clear. He wants me to stop doing this. But if you have the spirit, you have that advocacy. That's what this, that's what the spirit is. He's advocating for you. And it's not always pleasant. Sometimes he will poke you a little bit. You need, you need, you need to knock this off. Stop yeah. doing that. But it's for our own good. So if we have the spirit, that's what it's there for, to bring us into um kind of rein us into that 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 narrow path. But again, it's really not that hard when you look at it. The world just makes it into this huge thing. Yeah. The old life and no life is easy to be in the no life. I mean, when sin has a lot of consequences, I, I realize that when you're in sinful things, um, it it's fun, but there's consequences. It seems fun, it seems fun in the beginning. I remember because I was a pirate, so I used to pirate software. I was a college student. I would steal everything I could: music, movies, everything. Software for, for my for my classes. Yeah. Yeah, the real, yeah, poor Napster. This is yes, yeah, bootlegging everything I can. But I realized. After I got out of that, I never had to deal with viruses. That was just a, a simple concept. But I didn't have to deal with the, the dark side of it. And that's what sin is. There's usually a dark side behind what you're doing. Because you got to hide. you got to be in the dark. you got to avoid the, the, the authorities. You know what I mean? So there's a dark side behind that, that, that fun that you said that sin is for a while. It's freeing. It's freeing. Because I don't have to worry about things anymore. You know? It's what just less to think about. You will find out is... You will end up, if you are doing things that are against what scripture tells you or what scripture says, and you will start justifying it by saying things you cannot find in scripture. Mm -hmm. You have to. Yeah. God doesn't care what day you worship on. Well, you can worship any day. It doesn't. God doesn't care what day you worship on. God doesn't care what you eat. Yeah. Ask, ask Adam, Adam about Eve. that. He he made made it. It. Ask Adam about that. <laughs> and and you will hear these things over and over. And they will, people will, I've done it. I have said that to people. I've taught it. But when you start using a justification about why you're doing something that's contrary to what scripture says, and your justification is not in scripture, you know, yeah, you're being led by the spirit, but yeah. we're supposed to test the spirits because not all spirits are from God. 
the 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 evil spirits want to take you off of doing the things God tells you to do. That's why you're supposed to test the spirits. How do we test the spirits? How do you test spirits? Does it match the word of God? By the word. That's why you need to know it. Because if you don't know it, you don't know what's in it. Yeah, I like to somebody told me, yeah, the Holy Spirit told me it was okay for me to get a tattoo. <laughs> yeah. Not the whole back. <laughs> All right, I'll shut up. So with that, we're done. Um, we'll pick up in Romans. I can't remember where we're at. Uh, in Romans 7, 13? 12, 13, 14. Yeah, wherever Thir we finish off. <laughs> Romans 7, 13. We'll pick up there next week. Um, continue looking at sanctification and Paul breaking down um, the law, how it's good for us and how we need it, essentially. Um, Alex, you want to pray us out? Thank you, Father, for another day that we can get together and just learn from you, Father, just to take in all the all the scripture you have. Lord, just teach us to just follow you. you know, that you, your yoke is, is easy, and it's not that hard to follow you, Father. Father, just pray for everybody here on this table that they, they take something away from today's lessons, Lord. And in your most precious son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Is hold on.